Kenya and Kenyans first. So my fellow citizens, whereas President Kibaki has rested and a remarkable life ended, his service to our country will not rest until the last mile of his bold vision for our country, Kenya, is complete. We honor and salute him today for his toil in the run-up to our nation's independence, and most notably, as amongst the leading architect of the modern Kenyan state. As one of the last standing heroes of our independence struggle, he had a special calling to execute the last chapters of the vision of our founding fathers, and he did this with surgical precision and a total disregard for what the naysayers thought of him. He finished the last mile of our founding vision as a nation, but he did not stop there. He helped us lay the foundation upon which future generations shall also build. But to this, I must add one more thing. President Kibaki was by all means a modest man and did not believe in loud shouting. When the limelight was shone on him, he tended to coy and hide. And this is because he found virtue and joy by doing the ordinary things that fulfilled his promise and purpose. He knew that he could not fulfill his purpose in the presence of cheering crowds, and he had to do this in the privacy of his space. And his desire to contribute to transform our country, Kenya, in his quiet and secluded space with no one watching is what makes him a legend and a man of purpose. Fellow Kenyans, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to celebrate the man lying before us using three frames, Kibaki the man, Kibaki the leader, and Kibaki the visionary. I begin with Kibaki the man, and in celebrating his humanity, I want to pose an age-old question about our existence, and that is, what is the true measure of a man? How do you judge a man after he has served God, his generation, and country? Do you measure a man by his financial exploits or by how many lives he touched? Do you measure a man by the victories he gained or how he dealt with those he vanquished? Do you measure a man by how he handles losses, failings, and tragedies, or how magnanimous he is when he bags a win? Do you measure a man by how he treats his peers and equals, or how he treats his subordinates? Do you measure a man by what he started, or by what he finished? Do you measure a man by how he handled his finest moments or by how he handled his lowest moments. If you want to know the true measure of a man, watch what he does with power, how he handles his opponents, how he treats his wife and family, and what he does with his influence. But fundamentally, as Martin Luther King Jr. taught us, and I quote, the true measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of convenience and comfort, but where he stands in times of challenge and difficulties, end of quote. In other words, the true measure of a man is how he behaves when misfortune hits. And the question before us today, who was Kibaki the man? How do you measure a man who was sworn in as president in a wheelchair? 
How do you measure a man who suffered ill health during his first year of his presidency and in his lowest moments, he did not give up, but he soldiered on? How do you measure a man under whose watch Kenya experienced our darkest moment in 2007, yet in this moment, President Kibaki shook the hand of his opponent and invited him to form government with him on a 50-50 basis, despite opposition from some of his own supporters. Kibaki, the man, had an incredible gift of tolerance. He had the ability to take in pressure and pain without showing distress. And this is why he was known as a man of few words. From his 50 or so years of active politics, he learned not to rush into judgment and decisions. He learned to lay in wait until the swollen river had found its course. When moments were dark, he chose to be the light. When reason was scarce, he became the voice of reason. And when hope was down, he encouraged us all to exercise the gift of long-suffering. And if a man is not measured by what he started, but by what he finished, then the record must reflect that the Honorable Mwai Kibaki finished very strong. The end of Kibaki the man can only be summarized by the words of Apostle Paul when he said this of his own life, and I quote, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, the race and I have kept the faith. This too must be recorded in our books of history as the finishing line of the Honorable Mwai Kibaki. He fought the good fight, finished the race, and he without doubt kept the faith. So your excellencies, fellow Kenyans, ladies and gentlemen, turning to Kibaki the leader, as we have heard, from the story of his life and times, as far back as July of 1974, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki was named by Time magazine as one of the 150 men and women who would become new world leaders. Six years later, in 1997, and nine years later, in 1981, the same magazine named him as one amongst 100 people with remarkable leadership qualities. So the world had noticed his leadership promise. But his leadership abilities were not only obvious to the editors of Time magazine and the world at large. They were also noticed by those close to him as well. His professor at Makerere University in the 1950s, Professor Keith Ingram, noted, if Honorable Mwai Kibaki had not joined politics, he was destined to become the first African president of the World Bank. A similar observation was made by the former World Bank president Mr. Robert McNamara, who noted that President Kibaki was one of the greatest economic brains produced by Africa. And this is not a wonder, because President Kibaki was also the first African to attain a first-class honors degree from the prestigious London School of Economics and Political Science. But how did his leadership abilities, celebrated by the world, translate at home? How do we measure Kibaki the leader 
during his 50 years of service to our country. At a very early age, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki knew that the biggest challenge of a leader is leading yourself. And to lead yourself, you have to be measured, you have to be disciplined and unwavering. He understood that a leader who does not lead himself will be driven by his difficulties rather than his vision. He will give in to pressure of crowds rather than the chosen path appointed for him. Such a leader will be pushed to make popular choices that please crowds as opposed to bold choices that are good for country but may be unpopular at the moment. This ability to lead himself against the noise and buzz is what brought Muzeki Kibaki this far. His ability to lean in and deal with his most darkest and difficult moments, not in public, but in seclusion, is what distinguishes him as a great leader. And if the true measure of a man is determined by how he stands in a moment of challenge and difficulties, President Kibaki handled his political misfortunes with unparalleled grace. In every low moment, he acknowledged the impending danger, but chose to focus on the attendant opportunities. And two examples will support my observation here. The first happened in 1988, after the infamous Mulolongo election. During this election, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki had served as Vice President and Minister of Finance for 10 years under President Moy. When the new government was formed after the election, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki was demoted from his position as Vice President and made the Minister for Health. At that time, popular voices countrywide wanted him to reject what they saw as a humiliation and resign from government altogether. But he shunned the voices of the crowds and opted for the lonely and unpopular path then. To the shock of the nation, he embraced his demotion with grace and continued to serve the country in a lesser capacity. But his superior reasoning was that leadership is not a position, it is a service. And he was ready to serve the country in any position the people summoned him to. With this reasoning, the demands for his resignation were put to rest. The second demotion of his leadership came at the darkest hour in our history as a nation. This was the post-election violence of the year 2007. President Kibaki admitted to all of us that this was one of the lowest moments in his career as a political leader. But turning inwards, he converted this political misfortune into a constitutional moment. You cannot talk about the 2007 crisis without going back to the 2005 constitutional referendum. During this referendum, President Kibaki and his team that were called Banana Team suffered a resounding defeat in the hands of the Orange Team. But he banked the referendum loss as a dream deferred. And he knew that one day, someday, we will fulfill Kenya's clamor for a new constitutional dispensation. 
Then the 2007 crisis presented itself. At first, it was devastating. But with time, it gave him the opportunity to engage in a constitutional reset executed through bold and uncharted waters. First, and against the wishes of many, he ceded half of his government to his rival then, and he invited Prime Minister Raila Odinga to co-create government with him. Second, he needed to build consensus around his decision, and he did this because he understood that leaders do not look for consensus, rather they build consensus, as once again Martin Luther King Jr. told us. In March of 2008, he led the enactment of minimal constitutional changes to our independence constitution, which established the position of prime minister and two deputies, of which I am proud to have served as one. With the 2008 consensus in place and an inclusive government formed, the crisis of 2007 was resolved and spirited away. And in June of that year, our Vision 2030 was launched, setting the stage for better planning and the highest economic growth ever recorded in Kenya. The other notable achievement, which is also the third reset to our constitutional order, was the 2010 referendum. This referendum was meant to retire our independence constitution and allow, align our supreme law to the aspirations of a new republic. And in August of 2010, the deferred dream in 2005 became a reality. And apart from Vision 2030, the challenges of 2007 had gifted our country a new supreme law, the Kenya Constitution 2010. If the true measure of a man, therefore, is how he stands in times of challenge and difficulties, from the 2007 dark moment of our nation, President Kibaki stood tall and turned misfortune into positive change. These examples affirm that dreams deferred can never wilt away. Finally, fellow Kenyans, I will end my brief reflections with Kibaki the visionary. At the age of 29, the Honorable Mwai Kibaki was persuaded by Mzee Jaramogi Oginga Odinga to quit a well-paying job as a lecturer at Makarere University in Uganda and to take up a job that offered nothing but a promise. If this professor at Makerere University was right, Honorable Mwai Kibaki had the hope of becoming the first African president of the World Bank, a much safer and a much more assured path. But he rejected this dream in pursuit of a more challenging vision. He took on the job as the executive officer of Kano, then a little-known entity where he would survive on nothing but stipends. For him to make this decision, he must have been propelled by a vision that loved country more than self. Although identified by the international media as a world leader, he chose not to take the trodden path. Instead, he opted for the uncharted path of an independent Kenya and leave a trail. And this is what the 29-year-old Kibaki did. But to follow such a hazy path, he must, he must have listened to an inner voice, 
a voice that led him to what the heart sees, but not what the eye sees. A voice that took him to the path of faith. And because of this walk of faith, the Honorable Mwai Kibake must go down on record as a guardian visionary of our republic. Armed with faith and vision, the young Kibake, alongside the likes of TJ Mboya, drafted the founding instruments of our economy. Indeed, sessional paper number 10 of 1965 on African socialism and its application to planning in Kenya, drafted by him and Boya, remains the guiding light of our economic transformation. When he became president in 2002, he went back to this original blueprint and upgraded it to the Vision 2030 that now guides our country forward. And using this document, he encouraged us not to be intimidated by bold projects. And that is why my administration, inspired by this thinking, has accelerated what I call the big push investments, especially in the area of infrastructure. And if President Kibaki authored Vision 2030, the next administration must take us to a bolder plan. They must give us Vision 2063, a blueprint for Kenya at 100 years and beyond. So your excellencies, fellow Kenyans, ladies and gentlemen, the man lying before us today was a gentleman, a measured man, a man of few words, but a man of decisive action. If he was with us here today, he would have instructed us to choose leadership over politics. He would have told us that leadership is about vision, politics is about positions, and that nations are founded on visions. President Mwai Kibaki epitomized the quote that life is no brief candle. It is a sort of splendid torch which holds bold for a moment and a desire to make it burn as brightly as possible before handing it on to future generations. The light President Kibaki lit will never flicker out because his torch continues in the lives of millions. Therefore, as we mourn his passing, we are reminded that it would be a tragedy if we let die what he left alive in our hearts and memories. On this day, President Mwai Kibaki's enduring legacy illuminates our nation and our great African continent, placing him as one of the greatest African statesmen of his generation. To his family, to you, Judy, Jimmy, David and Tony, and to your families and the entire extended Kibaki family, I deeply share in the pain of your loss and pray that you will find comfort in the words of the psalmist when he said, and I quote, hold on my child for weeping may endure only for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Remember, my dear brothers and sisters, that no night can last forever. The sun will always rise, and with dawn comes hope and light. May God bless you all. May God bless Kenya. May God bless this great continent of Africa. Namungu amlaze babayetu. 
pahali pema ampatie amani na tutaendelea kuwaombea na tukae na huo umoja ambaye ametuachia Mungu awabariki na Mungu awalinde asanteni sana